Hello, I'm Dr. Mas Japonda, Clinical Research Fellow at the University of Liverpool. I'm now going to talk about Lecture 3, which is on infectious diseases for the MRCP Part 2. This will deal with complex infections or unusual infections that you may not necessarily encounter on a daily basis in the a &E. Let's go to question number one. A 24-year-old intravenous drug user presents to the a &E with a two-day history of blurred vision, photophobia, and a three-hour history of increasing shortness of breath. She has been injecting heroin and cocaine for seven years and has had previous admissions with groin abscesses and cellulitis. She usually uses clean needles. She smokes 20 roll-ups a day and works as a prostitute. She had a negative HIV test six months ago. Her companion feels that her speech has become more slurred since yesterday. On examination, she's afebrile, seems unwell and slightly short of breath. Her pulse is 72 and regular, blood pressure is slightly low, respirations are high, and saturations are 95% on room air. There is no lymphadenopathy, there is no rash, and her neck is supple. She has a right groin abscess. Heart sounds are normal, and her chest is clear. Her liver is felt two centimeters below the right costal margin, and her spleen is also felt one centimeter below the left costal margin. She has an ataxic gait, bilateral ptosis, and you are able to elicit diplopia. Chest x-ray is normal, ECG is sinus rhythm. Her blood results, show normal renal function, a slightly elevated but random blood glucose, CRP is markedly raised, and white cell count is normal, HB is normal, and platelets are normal. So what is the most likely diagnosis? Would you consider meningococcal septicemia? Would you consider heroin overdose, or myasthenia gravis, botulism, or even Guillain-Barré syndrome? So for question one, the answer has to be botulism. I think there are enough clues in the history that tell us this is botulism. Firstly, she is an intravenous drug user, and we know that intravenous drug users hide their stash from the police underground, so they will tend to bury this and therefore are at risk of getting botulism and tetanus. Again, botulism caused by Clostridium botulinum usually is associated with canned foods which have stayed on the shelf for a very long time. In terms of presentation, if we look at the next slide, you will see that it affects the acetylcholine receptors and causes ACH inhibition. So they can present with a myriad of symptoms, starting usually at the top with cranial nerve palsies and then a descending flaccid paralysis. They can have bulbar paralysis, hence the slurred speech that she was presenting with. They can also have uh, difficulty in breathing and they can have respiratory arrest. They can also have a cardiac arrest. There is no sensory loss, which is unlike Guillain-Barre, which was presented here. And polio, which would also cause an asymmetrical weakness associated with fever. The treatment has to be quite rapid in this case because of the fear of cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest. So supportive treatment, you would call the intensivist to intubate this patient, especially worried about the ventilation. An antitoxin has to be given quite quickly, and that would prevent the cardiac arrest. Debridement of any wounds, if there was an external wound, and giving penicillin and metronidazole would directly kill the clostridia, which is a gram-positive organism. Respons responds very well to metronidazole and penicillin. Let's now consider question number two. A 63-year-old Sri Lankan man presents with a four-week four history of cough, intermittent fever, night sweats, and malaise. He recently traveled to Sri Lanka for two months to visit his family. He denies hemoptysis or any TB contacts. He is a lifelong smoker, a known hypertensive, and he has been treated with a number of antibiotics prescribed by his GP. On examination, he is unwell, febrile, and tachycardic. Examination of his chest reveals reduced expansion on the right with dull percussion note on the right base and bronchial breathing above it. Examination of his abdomen was unremarkable. Chest x-ray shows a right-sided pleural effusion and patchy air space shadowing both lower zones. Results of the blood tests show blood gases PO2 of 11.45, which is not too bad, PCO2 and pH within the normal range. The patient was transferred to HTU and treated for a severe pneumonia. The pleural fluid scent proved to be negative for acid fast bacilli. A CT scan of his chest and abdomen, which has been shown there, revealed multiple loculated right-sided pleural effusions and a 10 by 6 centimeter hepatic collection. That's what's shown there. 
No organisms were grown on blood culture. Sputum, urine, stool, drainage, fluid, and wound swabs were all normal. Looking further at his bloods, you will find that his renal function was essentially normal. His bilirubin was not elevated, um, although his ALP was elevated at 152. His albumin was markedly low, and his gamma GT was elevated. Normal amylase, very high CRP, and a very high white cell count at 13.6. His INR was normal. So which is the best choice of antibiotic treatment in this gentleman? There are two pathologies going on here. This gentleman has a pneumonia, and we're told that he's got a pneumonia, and he's transferred to HDU for that. And he also has a liver cyst. Now, this liver abscess would be in keeping, especially with his travel history, the raised white cell count, the right upper quadrant pain with an amoebic liver abscess. So he has a pneumonia, which is most likely bacterial, and therefore coamoxiclav and clarithromycin would be reasonable treatment for that. But for the bacterial, for, for the amoebic liver um, cyst that he has, I would recommend adding metronidazole. So he would need at least 10 days of metronidazole for that. And so the only answer should combine all of those, the treatment for the pneumonia and the abscess. The top question, rifampicin, isoniazid, and ethambutol is for TB, but we clearly know from the history he has not had any TB contact. The fluid is negative for TB. Coamoxiclav and erythromycin wouldn't be able to cover the amoebic liver abscess. If he was allergic to penicillin, I would suggest anything like clarithro with metronidazole or doxycycline with metronidazole, but any combination that must have metronidazole. Kefuroxim would be insufficient cover for an atypical pneumonia. So I think the macrolide, the, the clarithromycin, is needed in this case. Let's now consider question number three. We have a young man here, 22-year-old, presenting with a four-day history of tingling at the right corner of his mouth and development of a cold sore 24 hours ago. Today, he woke up with crusted lesion over his face. Vesicles are also present, but only over his forehead, the tip of his nose, and chin. He has a past history of eczema affecting mainly his face. He has noticed some watering of his right eye. Medications include topical tacrolimus and no other treatment. He presents to the a &E department of a teaching hospital. What is the preferred initial management of choice? This is a straightforward case of herpes simplex. The unfortunate thing that has happened is that the vesicles have actually affected his eyes because we're told in the history that he has watering of his eyes. And so all the options that are being offered here are reasonable, except for the oral acyclovir. I would actually say go with C and say he needs IV acyclovir um, rather than oral. I would also have topical acyclovir and I would also think I would stop the tacrolimus, but I think overall the emergency here is his eye. The herpes simplex is affecting his eye and I think he needs to be referred quite urgently. Just to remind you that herpes simplex, once it hits the eye, can cause keratitis, it can cause scarring, it can cause uh, swelling, periorbital edema, as well as conjunctival edema, and even in worst case scenarios, it can cause scarring uh, of the of the lens and can cause a cataract formation and blindness and even glaucoma. So he would need to be treated by the ophthalmologist who might consider steroids, they might even consider topical beta blockers such as Timolol um, for his treatment of glaucoma if that was the case. But I think most of these would all be done, but the one that is needed and the correct initial management is urgent referral to an ophthalmologist. And now for question number four. A 26-year-old woman was admitted via ambulance, accompanied by her boyfriend. She had been complaining of a headache and nausea over the past few hours. He had noticed that she was becoming increasingly drowsy and confused. CSF results are shown here. You will notice the opening pressure of 160, which is normalish, protein of 0.33, glucose 3.7, and a blood glucose of 4.9, so relatively normal and a CSF count of 16, which is all lymphocytes. MRI scan showed increased signal in both temporal lobes. What is the most likely diagnosis? 
And here again, we have five options to consider. I think there are two things in the history that tell us the diagnosis. One, very obvious, the MRI scan shows high signal in the temporal region. And here is an example of an MRI showing exactly that. You will see on T2 bright signals in the two temporal lobes bilaterally. The second is the CSF has a lymphocytosis. Remember that 16 white cells is abnormal. What I would do to further confirm the diagnosis, which I think stands, speaks for itself from here, I would do a PCR on that CSF. And PCR is likely to be positive. This is herpes simplex encephalitis. Presentation, classic. Confusion, drowsy. Remembering temporal lobes, so there may be altered personality. The patient might present with aggression, lack of uh, inhibition. All these things, that unusual behavior, must immediately point to herpes simplex encephalitis. Remembering that the treatment is IV acyclovir high dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram TDS. That's usually given for 10 days. If it's not so barn door as clear as this, then what I would do is repeat after a few days, say four or five days, the, the lumbar puncture and the PCR on the CSF. This is herpes simplex, not to be confused with herpes zoster encephalitis. Herpes zoster has a predilection for the occipital lobes on the MRI, not the temporal lobes. So I think this is a few learning points which are very subtle, but very important for the exams. Let's now consider question number five. A 27-year-old homosexual male attends the clinic presenting with soreness of the penis with some itching. He has noticed some sp spots over the last two days which are exquisitely painful. He admits to a rash previously, but not like this. He admits to recently having unprotected anal intercourse with a casual partner. He also complains of dysuria and a white urethral discharge. Over the last week, he has also been suffering from flu-like symptoms. On examination, there are three shallow, tender sloughing ulcers under the foreskin, as well as generalized erythema of the surrounding skin. Urine dipstick is unremarkable, and urethral swab microscopy reveals pus cells. What investigation is most likely to provide the diagnosis? Syphilis serology, herpes simplex serology, PCR test for herpes, culture for herpes, and HIV serology. I'll give you a while to consider that. In a young patient, in a young man presenting with ulcers, penile ulcers, really there are three differentials to think about. You'd think of syphilis, you'd think of herpes, and you'd think of Haemophilus de Cray. Unlikely, but the most likely would be painful ulcers would have to be um, herpes simplex. The way I would confirm that is using PCR. I think serology is unhelpful, especially if they have had previous exposure, which would remain positive. But the PCR of the fluid would tell you immediately, either from the blister or the discharge or from the urine, would be able to tell you if that is herpes simplex type 2 that you'd be looking at. Culture is really unhelpful because rarely are you able to culture it. HIV serology, HIV does not present even in its seroconversion with the genital ulceration. Chancroid, which is Haemophilus ducre, would again be unusual in this setting. Remembering that in the UK there is an outbreak of syphilis amongst gay men at the moment. And so uh, that should be considered, but those would be painless ulcers. So the PCR here would be for herpes simplex, and I would treat this patient with oral acyclovir. There is no indication that he's sick, that he needs to be admitted or to have IV. A five-day course of oral acyclovir would be adequate. And now for question number six. A 58-year-old man born in Sierra Leone presents with shortness of breath worsening over the last six months in association with retrosternal chest pain. He sleeps on four pillows but denies any paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. He cannot remember if he has had rheumatic fever as a child. He moved to the UK 20 years ago. He tells you he did go to a clinic in Sierra Leone once to be treated for a sexually transmitted infection and he was treated with penicillin. He denies any history of skin lesions, especially on his genitals. Recently, 
He has been complaining of lower back pain and was diagnosed with arthritis by his GP. He's also hypertensive. His current medication include amlodipine, which is antihypertensive, and ibuprofen. Chest X-ray shows cardiomegaly, calcification of the ascending aorta and aortic arch, both of which appeared aneurysmal. Which is the most likely diagnosis? And here are five options to consider. This gentleman has tertiary syphilis and is presenting with aortitis. I think the clue in this question is the description of the chest X-ray, which we have demonstrated here, where you see the large expanding aortic aneurysm. Just to remind you about syphilis and its various presentation, primary syphilis would present with a painless ulcer, genital ulcer. Secondary syphilis would have Condyloma lata and a widespread macular papilla rash, both of those which are highly infectious are touching. Tertiary syphilis, which can happen many, many years after, it can happen up to 20 years, we're told this gentleman was born in Sierra Leone and migrated to the UK a long time ago, can present with either neurological presentation or can present with cardiac signs. And in terms of cardiac signs, he would have either aortic regurgitation or aortitis with an aneurysmal presentation. So this is a straightforward case of syphilis. Treatment of syphilis is with procaine penicillin. But for the aneurysm, you may want to consider surgical intervention if it is indicated. Let's now consider question number seven. A 29-year-old teacher is seen in the chest clinic following admission to hospital six weeks previously. At the time, she presented with a six-day history of persistent increasing dyspnea and right-sided pleuritic chest pain. Over the last two years, she has had episodes of nocturnal dyspnea, cough, breathlessness, and sputum, usually following an upper respiratory tract infection treated by a GP with antibiotics. She also has a history of dysmenorrhea for which she takes the oral contraceptive pill. On examination, her temperature is 37.6, She's not cyanosed, her blood pressure is normal, her pulse is 100 and sinus rhythm. Auscultation of the chest reveals bilateral, expiratory and inspiratory weasels with crackles at the right base. There was no pleural rub. Examination of all the other systems was unremarkable. Hemoglobin was normal, white cell count was normal, platelets were normal and ESR was elevated. Sputum, there was no growth and chest X-ray revealed shadows at the right base, apex. She was commenced on oral doxycycline and regular bronchodilators. She improved, but at the clinic today, she tells you that she has noticed specks of blood in her mucoid sputum. A chest X-ray in the clinic reveals new right-sided changes. Sputum culture, again, nothing is detected with normal uh, hemoglobin, but this time around a raised white cell count and an eosinophilia of 0.6. ESR is still elevated, as is the CRP, and the ECG remains normal. You rightly go on to do a VQ scan and there's low probability for a pulmonary embolus. Serum aspergillus precipitans are positive and the anchor is negative. Which is the most likely diagnosis? There are several clues in this question that tell you that this is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Let's review these. Firstly, she has fleeting shadows and various responses to antibiotic. Secondly, she has synophilia, remembering that 0.5 would be the cutoff that would accept. So she has an synophilia, although not markedly. She also, we're told, has serum positive aspergillus precipitans. All these would point towards a diagnosis of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Remember that this is an IgE-IgM reaction to the presence of aspergillosis and is more an allergy and would respond to antihistamines to a lesser degree, but more to steroids and bronchodilators. In addition, I would do skin prick test, which would be positive for aspergillosis. Let's now look at question number eight. A 22-year-old female is referred to your neurology outpatients clinic by her GP as she is not able to smile. She has been generally unwell for about a month 
and has had malaise, a runny nose, and muscle ache. She has also noticed a rash on her arm about a month ago, but this has now cleared up. She is studying for her master's at Yale in Connecticut. She doesn't drink, smoke, or take drugs. On examination, her pulse is 48, which is slow. She has no lymphadenopathy and her chest is clear. Heart sounds are normal. She is unable to smile, close her eyes tightly, or raise her eyebrows, but other than that, neurological examination is normal. You also notice that her right knee is swollen, but she feels that this must have happened when she fell. If we look at the blood results, HP is 13.8, white cell counts are slightly elevated, ECG shows a sinus bradycardia, and a chest x-ray is normal. Which is the most appropriate treatment? Would you give her prednisolone, hydrocortisone, doxycycline, aspirin, or acyclovir and prednisolone? This lady has Lyme disease, named after a town in Connecticut. So this is from a tick bite and will cause various manifestation. Firstly, the rash that she described, which was a fleeting rash, it came and it went. And here is an example of the type of rash that can be associated with Lyme disease. Then there are complications that can ensue, including um, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, but in addition to that, you can have cranial nerve involvement. So she's presenting with cranial nerve palsies, unable to smile. So a seventh nerve palsy is reasonable in this case. There can also be cardiac complications and you have PR elongation and also a bradycardia. If you remember, she's going at 48 beats per minute. In addition, you can have arthralgia, although she puts it down to falling, but this could be conceivably a late stage of Lyme disease. As I said, this is tick-borne, and the treatment is doxycycline, which you would use for at least three weeks. And now question number nine. A 37-year-old lady presents with a two-week history of increasing breathlessness, dry cough, and joint swelling. She has a painful left ear, and when she breathes in, she has a sharp stabbing pain on the right side of her chest. She is also concerned about a rash that has started on both arms and legs, which burns her, but is not itchy. She smokes 20 cigarettes a day, and her mother died of lung cancer at the age of 43. On examination, she is febrile with a temperature of 37.8, respiratory rate of 20 on exertion, and SATs are 94% on room air. She has symmetrical mucocutaneous lesions with concentric color changes in most lesions. She has erythematous left ear and occipital lymphadenopathy. She has coarse inspiratory crackles and the right mid zone. If you were lucky and looked in the ear, you might see this. Her blood counts show a white cell count that's elevated with a normal sodium, slightly low, normal renal function, and a raised alanine aminotransferase. Direct Coombs test is positive. What is the most likely diagnosis? For number nine, the most likely diagnosis is mycoplasma pneumonia. There are several clues in this question. Firstly, from her presentation, what she describes are erythema multiforme lesions. In addition, she has, if we were lucky and we looked in the ear, bullous meningitis, and that is pathognomonic of mycoplasma pneumonia. She has clearly crackles in the right lung, suggestive of a pneumonic process going on. In addition, her direct Coombs test is positive. We know that they have an autoimmune hemolytic anemia that may present, and this is usually in young adults. And the treatment for mycoplasma pneumonia, which is an atypical, would be clarithromycin. And so I would put that as the most likely answer rather than tuberculosis, small cell cancer, influenza, and sarcoidosis. Each of those have one or two features, but not the full house, which would be suggestive of M pneumonia. And question number 10. A 45-year-old female is seen in the emergency department with a three-day history of fever and increasing shortness of breath. She has a dry cough and some non-specific chest pain. She has recently returned from southern China where she had consumed the local delicacies and visited many of the public markets and parks. 
She smokes 40 a day and drinks alcohol at the weekend. On examination, she's febrile with a temperature of 38.5 and breathless at rest. She is centrally cyanosed and her sats are only 82% on room air. She has coarse crackles to both mid-zones. Chest X-ray reveals pulmonary infiltrates bilaterally to the mid-zones and bilateral small pleural effusions. CT scan of the chest shows extensive consolidation bilaterally with small effusions at both bases. When we look at her blood count, you will see that her hemoglobin is on the low side and her white cell count is elevated. Her platelets are normal. Sodium, potassium, urea, and creatinine are normal, although the creatinine is creeping up on the high side. The LFTs are also deranged. What diagnosis should be suspected? The clue in this case comes from where she has traveled. She's traveling to, to southern China and is presenting with a very severe respiratory tract infection. This would be SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is caused by coronavirus. If you will recall from the presentation, this usually was from animals transmitted to humans, especially in China, and then from human to human um, over in Canada. Various treatments have been used from antibiotics for secondary bacterial infections, but most results came from corticosteroids use um, as well as bronchodilators. I don't think this is a case of PCP. She does not desaturate. She has a low saturation, but has not got any other features of HIV. This is not tuberculosis or Legionella because this would be an unusual way for this to present. And so I think the best result and the best answer here is SARS. She would have to be treated and admitted to the intensive care unit because of the low saturations. We've looked at various questions for the MRCP part two in infectious diseases. We've looked at immunocompromised patients with HIV. We've looked at complex and unusual infections. And we've looked at infections from returning traveler. I hope that the variety for this will help you prepare for your exams, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Mm -hmm.